Hello, my name is Joe Wheaton. I'm a professor of riverscapes at Utah State University, and I'm delighted to be talking to you about uh, beaver-assisted and inspired riverscape restoration. And while this is a beaver summit, uh, what I want to focus on is actually sort of shifting um, our, our, our focus all, all uh, around the beaver. Um, and, you know, my purpose today, and I guess I should start maybe with my premise, that you guys are already beaver believers. You're the beaver dam choir. And I don't feel like it's my job to uh, hear preach to you about something you're already convinced on. Instead, I'm going to try on um, with you a way that we've been trying to package uh, beaver uh, as part of a broader suite of riverscape restoration and, um, and give you some different uh, tools as well as arguments and um, just sort of some language for how to uh, connect with other audiences of non-beaver believers. And I'll, just as an anecdote, start here with a couple that I think are really important to uh, the management of riverscapes, water users, as well as ranchers. And this is an article um, with the headline, Beaver Provides uh, Year-Long Water to Idaho Ranch. Uh, yeah, that does sound like uh, preaching to the choir here, Beaver, but this appeared in Beef Magazine, not exactly our uh, our choir, I wouldn't say. And um, we are making inroads on this, but I do think it's important not to always make this just about beaver. Let's let it be and make it also about um, about the people that we are working with and about um, how they are trying to to manage these 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 uh, landscapes and these riverscapes. So. Um, even though I will cover uh, sort of an overview of beaver assisted and inspired riverscape restoration, there are um, sort of 10 principles that I really want to go through to help you understand uh, what it is that constitutes a healthy riverscape and what it is you can do about that. And beaver absolutely can play a role in a lot of these places, but let's not make that the starting point out of, out of the gates, okay? Um, so all of this is wrapped up in uh, our recent uh, low-tech process-based restoration uh, design manual. Uh, as well as the distilled pocket guide version. Uh, there are tons of resources. There are free self-paced workshops. There are uh, all sorts of extra resources and learning modules um, online here. And this really represents a distillation of decades of riverscape science, uh, including a lot about beaver, uh, into uh, what we're hoping and is already becoming sort of the standard of practice for how you do this. Now, the problem that we're trying to address is simple. It's riverscape degradation. It's a massive problem. We spend a lot of money on it, but we've got millions of miles of streams and um, the billions that we are spending barely scratch the surface of the scope of degradation. Um, you could sum it up in a lot of places with things that look like this. And when we look at that quite naturally, uh, we focus in on, well, where's the channel, right? And let's try and restore the creek by restoring logically the channel. And we might map the active floodplain there. But then we never set our sights on the broader context of what these things could be, what they once were. Um, these inactive floodplains, not terraces, but just parts that because of the current conditions are no longer being accessed. Um, that's a piece of real estate that we look all too often past and don't recognize how important they are. And uh, we have a lot, you know, these systems that are starved of structure like wood and beaver dams, they take a lot of different forms, they look a lot of different. But one thing that is, is clear is that when we take that broader view of these riverscapes, of these valley bottoms, most of us have forgotten what um, they could look like. And 
you know, uh, Ben Goldfarb, Francis Backhouse, others have been doing a nice job of helping with prose kind of capture our imagination for just how pervasive riverscapes that looked like this were, even in very dry environments. Um, but on the science side, folks like Clure and Thorne are helping us with the sort of language expansion of old standing channel evolution models to highlight this role that, you know, stage zero and or eight uh, the, the, these systems, but basically cluttered up with structure, multi-threaded systems, and nastamosing is the technical term. And there's a whole bunch of resources in our science module. You can hear from these different scientists uh, explaining uh, what we've learned over the years and giving you ways to articulate that, you know, it's okay to, to, to like and shoot for messy, okay? Now, with the four principles of riverscape health, this is um, dumbing down a lot of science quite quickly, you know, to answer this simple question. Well, well, before we try and improve a riverscape, we better understand what constitutes a healthy one. And these span all riverscapes. Um, streams need space, structure, uh, like in this case, this beaver dam forces complexity, and that builds resilience to disturbance. Our favorite two words in the natural sciences, it depends, the importance of, of, of these things depends. And inefficiency, the inefficient conveyance of mass and water through this system is a hallmark of health. So let's take a closer, closer look at a couple of those. Most importantly, streams need space. How much space they need, they need their valley bottoms. This has been explicitly recognized in a shift towards conservation easements and uh, fluvial hazard zone mapping that actually recognize it's not just the static channel or the static channel and its static floodplain, but it's about giving the river room to flood and adjust and be a river. Um, and how much you need to do yeah, for that, you get good at reading your riverscape and recognizing this definition right here, that the valley bottom in this intact system is in green and blue. And notice that its width is varying. It's narrowed up here by an old terrace. It's narrowed up here by a fan that's puking out and pinching it up against one side. And so, you know, how much space it needs here versus how much space it needs here versus here, those are different answers. You know, but we can look at, instead of idealized, you know, intact riverscapes, we can look at a lot of uh, existing riverscapes. And we see so many situations like these two where the river have been pushed up to respective sides of the valley bottom to make way for different land use. In this case, it was grazing. In this case, it was a mix of grazing, um, cultivated agriculture, railroads, roads, houses, etc. And so, we can't shoot our sights in all systems on um, the whole valley bottom. Maybe on the one on the left, we could. But we can't express condition by how much of this is that it's still being accessed, how much of the valley bottom. So the proportion that's um, active versus the proportion inactive. And then we can ask the next question, how much is in play for restoration? We call that recovery potential. And on the left here, yeah, maybe the whole thing could be in play. And then we take a closer look at how we might get there um, through time using processes. But opportunity is that gap between condition and the current conditions and recovery potential. And uh, so you wanna think about how you can take advantage of that space. Now structure is gonna be the key ingredient that forces that complexity. Things like beaver dams that change hydraulics, they amplify geomorphic processes, leaving behind more diverse and complex habitat that supports more, uh, more uh, biodiverse riverscapes. Now, the resilience of those riverscapes, resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness, et cetera. And in the West, you know, we're facing um, increasing uh, amounts of these threats, whether it's fires, uh, catastrophic fires, droughts, uh, floods, et cetera. So a resilient landscape, I'm gonna illustrate this with some data from Nick Silverman from some low tech projects. The dots on here are points in time. Um, and this is from uh, a project in Nevada with grazing management. And the resiliency here is defined as how green the valley bottom stays as a function of precipitation. And if you're high, it means that uh, on, this, on this axis, it means that 
you're green no matter what. And if you're low, it means that you're tracking what the precipitation patterns is. And just with changing grazing management, that allowed beaver to come into the system and they made these a more resilient um, riverscape. And we're seeing similar responses happening uh, from wet meadow restoration up in headwaters, uh, from the Gunnison in Colorado, as well as from uh, beaver and beaver dam analogs um, out in Oregon. Another way um, and really compelling example of looking at the structurally forced resilience uh, is uh, to the disturbance of fire. And here's an example of a riverscape um, expressing the phenomenon that water doesn't burn. And so if you wet up those valley bottom sponges, um, then they can provide wildlife refugia. In some cases, if it's wide enough, actual fire breaks and uh, resilience to the post-fire runoff. This has been nicely highlighted in uh, some of Emily Fairfax's work that appeared in National Geographic just recently. So that fourth principle, the inefficient conveyance of water is healthy, is nicely illustrated in the contrast between a perfectly efficient system, the LA River, and one that's cluttered with beaver dams. And that inefficiency of water conveying from point A to point B is expressed at high flows with taking some of the peak flows, spreading that water out, um, forcing it to uh, infiltrate into uh, the valley bottom sponge and then slowly releasing that water out um, over time and elevating uh, post peak uh, base flows. This we refer to as the water magic trick because you haven't really created any more water. So on the top, um, I have the exact same riverscape in an undammed condition and all of the water is draining and free flowing. In the bottom, I have a uh, fully, uh, or I have a whole bunch of beaver dams that are causing water to be ponded, as well as forcing overflow over the floodplain. And I still have some free flowing. So I've gone from five to roughly 20%. And I only get there by having this diversified portfolio from structural forcing of flow types. And those flow types just reflect different residence time of water moving through the system. So when you do that, you do create more aquatic habitat, more volume of water at a snapshot in time. But there's no more water um, as a flow rate moving through that system. It's just this illusion um, by not letting the system be such an efficient drain. And that illusion is what we think is explaining in a lot of cases, this is from uh, beaver um, uh, population level responses uh, from, in this case, listed uh, salmon, uh, po responding positively to that. So now let's focus in on the key processes that uh, guide our restoration actions, okay? And so, um, Yes, uh, PBR is, uh, is, is process-based restoration. There's been some principles of process-based restoration, all very, very focused logically on process um, that have been around for some time. But what I think is easy to lose sight of is, you know, there's, there's just, it can be overwhelming when we start focusing on processes, like all the processes, right? So the processes themselves, the verbs, you know, and the nouns and the adjectives. So we've got hydrologic processes like flooding, attenuation, um, augmentation. We've got hydraulic processes, slowing, deepening, speeding up, shunting, splitting, backing up flows. Geomorphic, building up, cutting down, storing topography and sediment. Um, and biologic processes, you know, growth, survival, reproduction, death. Uh, so these things could be a bit overwhelming to know where to start. What do I focus on, right? There's this whole crazy suite of things and things like the stream evolution ch um, channel or triangle are trying to focus, you know, yeah, it's a suite of uh, physical and biotic processes that, uh, especially when we get up to these anastomosing or stage zero and eight systems. But what I'm going to suggest is that if you're working in structurally starved systems, and um, that's a pretty safe assumption for most of you, you could focus on, just like we focus on keystone species, that, you know, if they are present and they are doing well, then everything else underneath them must be. We could also focus on some high-level key processes. And so 
we have these conversations and it's all about, you know, the beaver dams or the wood jams, right? So let's focus on wood accumulation as a process or beaver dam activity as a process. Your actions may build in a low tech way, some simple little structures like a PAL, a post assisted log structure or a BDA, but they're not the solution. The solution is like, you know, wood getting recruited and piling up on a structure like that. Beaver um, uh, maintaining and raising, you know, the crest elevation, for example, of a beaver dam analog. Those are the key processes you focus on. And so when it comes to how we translate this into some principles of what restoration actions you take, we've got six principles, and I'm just going to run through them. Number five, it's okay to be messy, okay? So uh, we're so used to building, you know, uh, like houses or bridges, right? We don't have to make our riverscapes um, and our structures that we build in them perfect, right? We can make them a little bit more cluttered and messy and take inspiration from, from beaver uh, that make messes and it's okay, so can you, all right? There's strength in numbers. This is a fundamental principle. We need to scale up the scope of degradation and we need a, a lot of redundancy. We need a whole bunch of this stuff. These things have been starved for so long. We just got to get some calories back in, some big meals. This is a map of a small portion of a much bigger riverscape restoration project. This is just two miles. Look at the density of structures, right? These are all different types, different flavors of woody debris structures. Um, you're going to have to you have to build um, a lot, but not any single one of them do you have to spend that much time on. When we're building them, just take inspiration from the whole foodie movement, right? Uh, build with local ingredients, natural building materials, you know, things not fortified with, you know, chemicals or uh, artificial preservatives. Uh, also, pay attention to what's around you. Um, in the American West, we have so many places where, whether it's rangelands or forest lands, where fuel buildup is massive, and we've got this massive ticking time bomb there that's changed the hydrology and is um, just prime kindling for fire. Fuels treatments um, to get rid of uh, a lot of that material uh, produces byproducts that don't have a lot of commercial value. Well, they have tons of value as some of the meals in these systems, and we can couple the upland and the in-channel in, in treatments uh, to, to, to feed um, some of these starved systems. Letting the system do the work, this is the essence of process-based restoration. You want to rearrange the topography of a riverscape to make it healthier, to make it better. But you don't have to do it with, as Jared McKee says, diesel power. You could let stream power do the work. Um, and this is um, in New Mexico. You know, we heard uh, Bill Zedike earlier. Uh, this is his catchphrase, right? Let the water do the work. Um, you can also let the rodent do the work. Letting the rodent do the work is encapsulated in this idea of deferred decision making. Um, you don't have to decide everything. You don't have to decide where to put the channel. You don't have to decide what height to set the floodplain to. Um, the flood and the rodents activity could uh, do this for you. And it's a great way of transferring liability um, and decision making to the ecosystem engineer. You just need to put the bounds of expectation management um, on there, and that's really your valley bottom. And finally, and most importantly, it, to, you know, with a bit of humility, you need to recognize that you know you don't want to be in the business of mimicking a riverscape uh, pr process forever, mimicking beaver dam activity. You can do it for a little bit, but only if you've got a clear idea of how that is going to promote beaver and other natural processes to take over for you. And then what's your exit strategy? Ultimately, what makes that self-sustaining? And this is sort of spelt out nicely in Ben Goldfarb's uh, Beaver Rebooted uh, article that appeared in Science. It means that every project you do, um, whether you're using beaver to translocate and release them to a site where you hope they can do good, maybe you build a beaver dam just to just a, a fake one just to release them into so they have some um, some cover from predation immediately and they're comfortable. You know, what's your immediate mimicking? How quickly um, can you promote that process naturally um, to, uh, taking place? And um, eventually what would self-sustaining look like? When would you say, great, these processes of wood accumulation and or beaver dam activity, they're in place and they are doing their job.
So um, that's your ultimate goal, thinking about um, how you can create uh, self-sustaining uh, riverscapes. This idea is uh, baked into uh, numerous federal and state agencies are, are, are using this, but um, the NRCS has recently adopted uh, this as one of their standard conservation practices. Um, it is authorized in the Farm Bill. There is a uh, cost code for it, but it is a conservation practice and not an engineering practice. That means it has a design life of less than a year. And the whole problem is redefined around building a structure not to last, but promoting process. And finally, coming back to communicating with others, we can, talking about this low tech process based restoration is a lot less confrontational in a lot of settings than talking about, you know, oh, well, beaver are the solution everywhere. Beaver are not the solution everywhere. There are a lot of places where they are the key ingredient and they speed up these things and they're how you get to self sustaining. But you can tiptoe into that and find the common ground around a shared vision of resiliency. So our lessons from Beaver, it's okay to do things you thought you weren't supposed to, like be messy, like letting somebody else, the system, do the work, deferring decision-making. The buck stops, not with you, but with the process. And you can get out of the way by treating this as a real estate problem and giving riverscapes the space um, of their valley bottoms. You can allow for inefficiency and recognize that that's healthy. And um, those things collectively buy you healthy and resilient riverscapes. And please plagiarize legally. Any of these slides, any of the resources on our lowtechpbr.restoration.usu.edu website, they're all there for you to speed things up, make it easier for you to tell these stories to your own audiences and, um, and tackle these projects. So I wish you all the best of luck.